Hey there, welcome back to Flat Tire Farm. Today we're gonna make a rhubarb cherry grilling sauce and we're gonna water bath can it so it's shelf stable for two years. Now this is rhubarb, it's pretty, it looks like a red and green celery. It's pretty bitter um, and pretty sour. However, it grows really good in cold states. It grows great here and you cannot kill it. Now this is not rhubarb from our yard. Our rhubarb is still a baby, I'll show you. See, he's just little. <laughs> Now that little baby rhubarb, that's actually its second year because we tried to kill it a couple of times um, and it just keeps fighting. But as small as it is this year, it'll be huge next year, like our neighbor's plant. Thanks, Colin and Sam. Now our neighbors were nice enough to share some of their rhubarb with us. Um, I drive by their house and I see they have a great big rhubarb plant. Um, and so I called them up and said, hey, how about I make us some rhubarb cherry grilling sauce with your rhubarb? I'll share some with you. Um, and they were happy to do it because as prolific as rhubarb is, there's not a whole lot of ways that people like to use it. Um, you got to be creative. Um, and so usually there's extra to be had. Now this grilling sauce is going to be really good for basting your chicken or your pork with before you put it on the grill. You can also um, baste it on your meat before you put it in the oven. And you could use it as a sauce for after it comes out of the oven. But first, we got to start chopping. Okay, first you gotta cut the end off, the end that connects to the plant. It's got some weird brown papery stuff on it. And then I'm cutting it into eighth inch slices just because it'll cook faster. You can make big chunks out of it. You can stick it in a food processor. It doesn't really matter. You just have to make sure to adjust the cooking time so that it gets soft enough to puree. Okay, it looks like we ended up with 10 cups of rhubarb. Um, this should make me about five pints of um, rhubarb cherry grilling sauce when I'm all done. In the description below, I'll give you the recipe or the ingredients, what you'll need to make a one pint batch. Um, if you've watched any of my other cooking videos, you know I like to make big batches and get it all done at once and have it on the shelf for two years. Um, but I know that most people aren't like that. And also you might want to try it before you make a big batch of it. So 10 cups of rhubarb in the pot. For every two cups of rhubarb, you need one cup of cherries. Now these are those frozen pitted cherries that I got from Azure Standard. Um, and so I got five cups of cherries. For every two cups of rhubarb, you're gonna need a quarter cup of onions. So that means that I need one and a quarter cups of onions for this batch. Um, these are the organic onions that I got in bulk from Azure Standard. I diced them up and stuck them in my freezer and it makes days like today pretty easy. <laughs> okay, and for my big batch, I need two and a half cups of red wine vinegar, or if you're just doing the single pint version, you'll just need a half a cup. Um, I find that red wine vinegar is too expensive, or maybe I'm just too cheap, and I, the things might be true. Um, and so I just take some regular old white vinegar, and I add some cheap old box red wine to it, and there's my red wine vinegar. Okay, for the small batch, you need two thirds of a cup of brown sugar. So for my big batch, I need three and a third cups of brown sugar. Now this surely is not brown sugar, um, but I'm cheap. So I'm gonna use white sugar and I'm gonna cheat and add a little bit of molasses to it um, instead of buying brown sugar because brown sugar is like more than twice what white sugar is. So I'll just put a couple tablespoons of molasses in this, um, probably two for this amount of sugar. You're gonna need half a tablespoon of lemon zest. Um, and so for my big batch, I need two and a half tablespoons. And if you have a better zester than this one, which works, but it is, it is lovingly nicknamed Flesh Shredder, um, I would like it if you would leave it in the comments below because I'm not sure that I can keep using this thing and keep my fingers at the same time. Um, so leave it below if you've got a cool one that doesn't eat your fingers, I would greatly appreciate it. For your batch, you're gonna need two teaspoons of grated ginger. Um, and so for my big batch, I need two tablespoons plus just a little bit more. <laughs> for your one pint batch, you'll need half a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. And so for me, I don't know, I'm gonna use that much. <laughs> for your little batch, you'll use a pinch of salt. Um, 
This is Redmond's Livestock Salt. You know how they have the real salt for the people version. Um, but I found if you just take the livestock salt and grind it down, um, it works just the same. The only concern with the livestock salt was that it has a little bit of grit in it. Um, but when you grind it up, you don't notice it. I did actually a whole video on that where I compared the two. I'll put it at the end if you want to watch it. Um, so you're going to need just a pinch. So I'm going to need just a little more than a pinch. There you go. You don't want to put too much salt in there. Otherwise it gets real funky tasting. So just a pinch guys, just a pinch. Okay. For your little batch, you're just going to add three drops of liquid smoke. Um, make them small drops. So for my big batch, I'm just going to do my best guesstimation here. That should be good. Now, so we got all of our bajillion D ingredients in there. It's pretty in there. Once it comes up to temperature and starts boiling a little bit, um, then we'll simmer it for 10 minutes. Okay, everything's cooking down a little bit. We just needed everything to soften, that's all. Okay, now we're going to immerse and blend this. We're just gonna get everything all nice and soft and pureed and no more chunks. Okay, we got this all blended down. There's no more chunks in it. Um, it's a little bit frothy because I think some of the rhubarb was still a little bit uncooked. Um, see if I can show you in just a second what it looks like now. We want it to get nice and dark red, like dark raspberry colored. Um, and we're gonna let the sugar come up to a boil a little bit. And we're gonna let it cook for about 15 minutes just so that sugar can start um, activating and this gets cooked down all the way. It's opaque, it's not translucent at all. And um, it's just a little frothy looking, a little white colored. So 15, 20 minutes, we'll cook it down, boil it down, I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, I'm hoping you can see it looks a little different. It's much more translucent and way less opaque than it did before. Okay, so now it's time to get the water bath canner going. I have my water bath canner filled high enough with water that when I put the pint jars in, the water will come up to an inch or two inches above the top of the jar. We're gonna get it started on high and getting it ready to boil. And while that's happening, we'll fill up the jars. I wanted to show you something. Um, I don't know how much pint jars are at your house, um, but around here, they are almost $14 for a case and quart jars are $20 for a case. But I did find um, these pint jars, they're golden harvest pint jars. And um, I was able to pick them up at Walmart, I think for $11 a case. Um, anyways, at least a couple dollars cheaper. And I did can um, some stuff with them yesterday and the seals came out just fine and I was happy every single one of them sealed. Um, sometimes when you buy cheap jars, the seal doesn't work and then you've wasted all your money and time and energy. Um, but Golden Harvest, that might be available in your area, a couple dollars cheaper than, uh, than the name brand kind. Okay, so this is water bath canning because um, I got a bath full of water. It's not a pressure canner. We're not, pressure, we're not pressurizing anything, um, but this is what you need, a jar. A dryer funnel, a ladle, cause that business is hot. <laughs> We're gonna ladle it in the jars. Do, do, do. We're gonna give it half an inch of head space, which just means fill it up to half inch from the top of the jar. And that's about halfway up the threads. They do make a little bubbler tool that has a little measury guy on it. Um, and if you're not familiar with canning, you definitely should do that. Um, but I'm not gonna do that. We want to make sure that the rim of that jar is really clean. So we're going to get a paper towel and just some old white vinegar. We're going to wipe the top and make sure it's perfectly clean. I also, after that, run my finger on the top just to make sure because fingers are really good at feeling stuff. <laughs> and then I'll know if there's anything on there that doesn't belong. You put the lid on. You make the little rubber stuff sit on the top of the jar on its little edge there. And then you're going to tighten the ring down finger tight. Finger tight means you just wait till the jar catches or wait till the ring catches, just barely. 
and you're gonna turn it an eighth of the circumference of the jar or an eighth of a turn. And we're gonna put it in the water. Bye bye. <laughs> I'll do that four more times and see you back in a sec. Okay, we got our five pints and then it looks like we got almost a sixth pint. Um, but I'm not gonna um, put this in the canner. I'm not gonna waste a new lid um, on it. So, because that's just way too much headspace, it's not going to make a good seal. So, I'll just put it in the fridge and we'll use it up this week. Once the water bath canner gets all the way up to boiling, I'll set a timer for 10 minutes. Um, we'll let it cook in there for 10 minutes. Then we'll turn the timer off, let it cool for a little bit. I'll meet you back in a sec. You know, looking at this jar that's going to go in the fridge, it looks a little bit runnier than what I'd like. So next time I make this, I'm just gonna cook it down a little longer until it gets kind of more like a gooier sauce. Um, and it still may thicken up once the sugar water bath cans. Um, but if you think that's too runny for you, then cook it down a little bit more in this pan um, before you put it in the jars. Okay, timer's beeping. Turn that off, turn that off. Take the lid off. Ooh, mama. Ooh, that is boiling. So I'm gonna let it sit, oh, just for a couple minutes. You're supposed to let it sit for 10 minutes, okay? But I'm gonna let it sit till it's done boiling, just a couple minutes, and then um, we'll take them out of there and see how we did. Okay, I think I've waited long enough, long enough for me anyways. See how we did. Looks just fine to me, happy, happy. A um, couple of house cleaning things. Um, number one, if you hate the way that I described the ingredients for the different size batches, the small batches and the big batches, if you hate that, please tell me. If you think it makes it confusing and a disaster and an unwatchable video, please tell me. Um, it's just that I make such huge batches of things and that's just not a realistic amount for most people. So if you hate it, tell me. If you like it, tell me. If you have a different idea of how I could do that without being so convoluted, um, please tell me. Uh, number two, if you want the link for Azure Standard so that you can buy organic produce and check out the prices and see is it cheaper locally for you or cheaper on Azure Standard, there's a link below. There's also, did you hear the pop? It's working. There's also gonna be a link below for um, the National Center for Food Preservation for how to can and all the canning rules. There's also gonna be a link below for the rhubarb compendium, something you didn't even know existed. Um, it is like a giant conglomeration of all the rhubarb recipes that anybody in the world could ever think of. Um, and I find that a great resource. This recipe is not on there, um, but there's lots of other really cool recipes. Uh, also in the description below is gonna be equipment that we used today. And, oh yeah, one more thing, and the recipe um, or the ingredients for the pint, uh, what it is per pint. Oh, one more thing is important. Um, if you let this sauce sit a little bit on the shelf before you use it, at least a couple of weeks, um, the flavors kind of mingle a little better and the hot pepper comes out a little bit. Um, so that was important. As always, thanks for joining us on Flat Tire Farm. I hope you enjoyed my cherry rhubarb grilling sauce video today. If you grow rhubarb where you're at and you've got cool ways to use it, leave it in the comments below. I'm always trying to find new ways to use rhubarb. Um, on our new property here, we plan on having lots of rhubarb. When I start growing some more, I'm gonna make some rhubarb barbecue sauce, which is gonna be awesome. And I'm gonna try to make rhubarb curd, but we'll just hold off on that. Just hold on, we'll get there, okay? <laughs> 